Yes. Okay, great. Um, so I want to welcome everybody. Um, my name is Erin Farley, and I am a research associate here at JRSA. And for those of you who are less uh, familiar, uh, JRSA stands for Justice Research and Statistics Association. Uh, we are a national nonprofit organization dedicated to the use of research and analysis to inform criminal and juvenile justice decision making. And we are comprised of a network of researchers and practitioners, which at the core include directors and staff from state statistical analysis centers. It is my pleasure today to welcome you to our webinar titled Police Community Dialogue. It will be presented by a panel of uh, three, uh, Lori Charcudian, I think, did I get that right? Or I think I might have butchered it a little bit. Charcudian, second, second time's better, uh, who is the Executive Director of the Community, um, Community Mediation Maryland. Tracy Ford, who is a certified mediator, trainer, and evaluator and Marvin McKenstry, Jr., who is a professional facilitator and youth development executive. And I believe the fourth um, individual who is not here today is Zachary Novak, um, who is an officer with the poli uh, Baltimore Police uh, City Police Department. So I want to welcome everyone. And before we go any further, I want to thank our partners at the Bureau of Justice Statistics for helping to make this webinar possible. I would also like to cover a few logistical items. Okay. We will be recording today's session for future playback. The link to the recording will be posted on the JRSA website, usually posted the following day. Uh, today's webinar is being audio cast via both speakers on your computer and teleconference. We recommend listening to the webinar using your computer speakers or headphones. To access the audio conference, Select audio from the top menu bar and then select audio conference. Once the audio conference window appears, you can view the teleconference call-in information or join the audio conference via your computer. If you have any questions for the presenter or would like to communicate with JRSA staff, please submit all questions to me, Erin Farley, using the chat feature on the right side of your screen. Um, or you can submit um, to everybody as well. Uh, that's not an issue either way. Uh, the session is scheduled for one hour, um, or a little bit over one hour. Uh, if you have technical difficulties or get disconnected during the session, you can reconnect uh, to the session using the same link you used to join initially. And you can also email Jason Trask at jtrask at jrsa.org. Uh, in the last five minutes of today's webinar, we will ask you to complete a short survey, and the information that you provide will help us to plan and improve future webinars and to meet our reporting requirements. So let me move, cover that, okay. And so with that, I again want to welcome everybody and our panel, and I will turn it over to Lori and her colleagues. Welcome. Great, thank you so much. Uh, it's an honor to be able to do this, so welcome to folks joining us from across the country. Um, we are, uh, my name is Lori Charcudian, and I'm the Executive Director of Community Mediation Maryland. We're gonna do introductions in just a second. Um, about who we actually have in the room. First, I want to talk about the context of what we're talking about today. So today we're going to talk about three distinct approaches to using dialogue to respond to police community relations. Before we do this, we want to honor the fact that the work that we're doing, as powerful as it is and as important as it is, is really just one piece of the bigger puzzle. So we're not going to try to address all of the larger issues that we think need to be addressed for us to really have the kind of police community relations long term that we need in this country. We recognize that these are complex issues, that there's roots of historical oppression, and that it's impacted really by broader economic and other injustices. So. Um, while we think that the work we're doing is really powerful and we hope to see it replicated in other parts of the country, we also think that it's just one part of the puzzle. And so we just want to start by honoring the complexities of the issues that we're working on and, um, and just sort of put that out there. Um, so the, the, um, the three approaches that we're going to talk about today are police complaint mediation, police use dialogue circles, and collaborative policy development, wherein um, law enforcement and the community work together to develop or to change policies about how policing is done in the community. Um, so who we are, uh, Community Mediation Maryland 
is a, a, a statewide organization that supports the work of 17 grassroots community mediation centers. Those mediation centers um, are uh, provide free mediation services for a range of issues across uh, across the state of Maryland. Um, the other thing that Community Mediation Maryland does is that we identify new uses for mediation to respond to complex social challenges. And so that includes prisoner reentry issues, that includes addiction recovery, roles for mediation and addiction recovery in, um, in, in school discipline and so on. And so police community mediation is, is one of the areas that we do that work in. So I'm Laura again, I'm the director. And with me here today is Tracy Ford, who has been a leader. Um, she's our uh, director of quality assurance. She has been a leader in a lot of the police community relations work that we've done across the state. Um, she and I have both also done work in New Orleans, developing their police complaint mediation program. So we'll be sharing our experiences both in Baltimore and different parts of Maryland and also in New Orleans. Um, also joining us today is Marvin McKenstry, who is with the Youth Opportunity Center. He has been a community leader and very active in um, the police uh, community facilitated policy discussion that we're going to talk about later in this hour. And um, Kennard Smith uh, is one of the young people who's been involved also in that policy discussion. Unfortunately, Officer Zachary Novak was not able to join us um, today. He has been involved in the in the policy discussion in West Baltimore, um, but he had to do a CompStat meeting today. So all the statistics people who are on this webinar can appreciate um, the fact that he needs to be there instead of with us today. So, um, so the the four of us here will be talking about uh, about these experiences. So the first approach that we want to talk about is police complaint mediation, and Tracy's really going to take the lead on that part of it. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tracy Ford. So, um, a couple of things you need to know about police complaint mediation. So they gen they all start with a resident complaint about um, an interaction that they have with the police department, police officer, um, and those. Those complaints get directed to the Community Mediation Center, and the mediation centers work to have um, to assign their volunteer mediators to those cases. Those um, mediators that are assigned to the cases have done 50 hours of basic mediation training, and then in addition, after they've completed their apprenticeship, done at least five mediation cases. Then they do 15 hours of police complaint mediation training. Um, there are a lot of the reasons that I have seen um, as one of the folks who do the police complaint mediation um, as a mediator is that um, communication and understanding of policies around uh, for police officers are some of the biggest reasons that residents are using the services and police officers are using this service. So getting clarification. Um, an example being um, we recently had a, a mediation uh, case where the resident only understood that it was a typical festive night on the strip um, where they were on uh, the, the local bar strip, and they really just wanted to get home. And traffic was slowed, they were irritated, and so they decided to maneuver around the traffic. And next thing they know, they are being stopped, they have the light shined in their face um, by the police officer, they felt like they were yelled at and spoken to disrespectfully. And at the mediation table, what they learned was there was a medical emergency further up the road. And that was the reason that um, traffic was being slowed, not because of a bar crawl or, or a party. As a result of that conversation, they also found out when they started to maneuver out of the traffic, they couldn't see ahead because of the way the lights were they didn't realize that they were very close to hitting one of the police officers. And so the sergeant that stopped them was saying, you know, I have a responsibility to protect my officers and you were putting my officers at risk and the, the medical staff as well as the person who was having the medical emergency was also being put at risk when you diverted, you know, out of the traffic, out of the way that we were um, trying to direct traffic. Um, so clarification about what the policies are, and then residents being able to say what their expectations are from police officers in terms of how policies get implemented and what communication, and a lot of times we're talking about communication. Like, I need you to talk to me like this. 
if you let me know what is happening, I'm happy to comply, but I didn't know, you know. Um, those kinds of things come up frequently um, in police complaint mediation. Um, we still uphold what we call our big three. This is still a voluntary process. So both the officers and the residents can say, no, I do not want to do this. Um, often some of the reasons why they would want to do this is um, for, for the officer, this does, um, it, it, it um, does not go to investigation if it goes to mediation. Um, and for the resident, they often find that they really just want to have a conversation with the police officer and let them know the impact of their interaction on, on them, their lives, their family, their home, their employment. Um, um, yeah. So um, um, this is this is Lord now. Um, so as Tracy was talking, you got to hear a little bit about the kinds of cases that get mediated. Um, a couple things about the kinds of programs and what makes the police complaint mediation successful. Some of the really important things include having mediators who represent the diversity of the community serve as mediators. Tracy talked a little bit about the training, making sure they have extensive training, making sure that the mediation is provided by an agency that's viewed as neutral. So it's really important that both the police officer and the resident believe that this is going to be a place where they are going to have a, um, where they are going to have a chance to be heard, um, and where the mediator's job is to help create understanding at a deeper level. Um, the mediations are held in a time and place convenient to the participants, and, um, and generally a co-mediation model is preferred. The data that we want to um, share with you a little bit about the program and the success of the program, um, th this data actually comes from New Orleans, uh, and so that's a program that has been around for a couple of years now, and so they have a little more data than we have um, in Baltimore. And so you can see sort of scanning down here, a lot of this is the post-mediation um, evaluation form uh, reports where you can see civilians talking about getting a better understanding of policing or police officers talking about building more mutual respect between the civilian and the officer. Um, and so part of what happens through the dialogue that's different from an adversarial investigative process is that the goal and the focus is to build understanding um, and, and to build uh, sort of to humanize the officer and the resident to each other and then to build a broader understanding. And the idea is that, that as that understanding gets built, both officers and residents who go through it and what they share with their family members and friends, um, will, will be a piece of what can start to shift in terms of how communities and law enforcement interact with each other. The other area of evaluation that we do is we ask some, a series of questions before and after the mediation. And so we look at, um, at uh, what civilians is uh, on um, respect for the community. And again, this is an area where there's an increase in the sense of respect um, for the community. Lurg, I'm going to interrupt real quickly. We have a quick question, and I don't know if you, you might have answered this, but um, someone asked, uh, you mentioned that the police complaint mediations are voluntary for police. How do you get officer buy-in? What is the incentive for them to participate? And I think you had mentioned that that was uh, because it prevents it from going forward to an investigation. Is that correct? Yeah, so, so I think that for both officers and residents, um, one of the things that when people understand that they'll get a chance to speak and be heard without judgment in a confidential setting, that by itself is actually a really attractive idea for folks. And the confidentiality is a really important piece of it because often people are looking for an apology, and in the context of mediation, an apology can happen, and in fact does. Both officers and residents might apologize to each other, sometimes both in the same mediation. And because none of the information that's gathered in the context of the mediation can be used in subsequent adversarial hearings, there's no, there's no danger in being vulnerable and real about, you know, hey, I think I made a mistake, or now that I understand your perspective, I would have done things differently. And so I think um, at, at, at one level, 
the reason people sign up to do it is because they actually want to be heard and they want to be understood. And I think that that's sort of a normal human experience, whether you're coming from law enforcement or from the community. Um, but more specifically also, there is the incentive of if it goes through this process, then it does not go through the formal investigation process. And so even if an officer thinks that they would win in a formal investigation process, they may find that process to be burdensome and they may not like having that sort of going on on their personnel file, you know, th through what is often a very long and cumbersome process, and so they may choose this as a as a preferable way to to experience it. So hopefully that answers that question. Great. Thank you. And the, the community mediation center spends a lot of time talking to um, police officers at their stations. So um, they're in the process right now of going to all the roll calls for uh, 27 roll calls for each um, on, on all the shifts. So they're going to the 7 a.m. roll call, the 4 o'clock roll call, and the 10 p.m. roll call to educate police officers about about this service and, and address any questions that they have before a complaint goes out. So just kind of introducing it as early as possible. So one of the things um, this again is, is from the New Orleans data, and I, I won't read all these out loud, but I will leave it up while I while I talk for a minute. Um, one of the things that uh, that we do, of course, is in addition to the quantitative data that we're gathering from people, we ask people to share their experiences. Um, and I think what you can see if you read some of the comments is um, when we think about really how do we make shifts in police community um, relations. Um, one piece of that is police understanding how their actions affect community members, and another piece of it is uh, community members understanding why police are making the decisions they're making and also being able to share with the police um, how those, those choices are impacting them. And so what you can see from these comments is this real learning and understanding um, that comes out of the process. Uh, sometimes in this last quote here, the very long quote, um, sometimes there's really some deep conversations about race that gets to happen in a safe place, and it's very unusual to be able to have that kind of conversation between an individual officer and a community member um, where they can talk about really complex issues and, um, and painful issues about race, and, and those kinds of conversations get to happen in the context of a, of a mediation process that might not happen um, in a standard, or definitely wouldn't happen in a standard complaint process. The next slide we have here is, um, is from community members, and what you can see is there's, there's sort of two, two different pieces um, to the kinds of comments that are made. There's, again, a lot of learning, like understanding why it is that officers made the choices that they make, um, but also just this chance to really express oneself. And so this piece, when we think about procedural justice, about having voice in the process, um, and that's a really important part that happens in the context of a police complaint mediation um, is that people who are directly affected are the ones who have voice in the conversation, both about building the understanding and also in the, about the possible outcome. So quickly around the country, um, and this is just a, um, a, qu a quick overview of some of the programs we're familiar with. I think um, my sense is there's probably about 40 areas in the country that actually have Community, uh, police complaint mediation on the books. Um, here's uh, some of the larger ones. Um, and uh, some of them have been around for a long time. Um, San Francisco's been around for a long time. Um, Denver, which is not on here, has been around for a long time. Some of them are newer. New Orleans has been around for about three years. Um, and in Baltimore, we just started offering the service in Baltimore in January. Um, so over the, one of the sort of interesting things that we have in Maryland now that we don't have anywhere else in the country is, uh, is legislation that supports the development of police complaint mediation across the state. And so in uh, 2015, soon after the Baltimore uprising, the there was the creation of the Legislative Public Safety and Policing Work Group. And that legislative body really looked at issues of uh, policing and police community relations and recommended the creation of a police training and standards commission, which um, was sort of a hybrid of, of something that already existed, but it kind of created in a more formalized way. And then one of the recommendations of this work group was that this police training and standards commission um, 
develop a police complaint mediation program. So develop basically model standards that would then be um, that they would then encourage every law enforcement agency in the state to replicate and to and to develop um, police complaint mediation. And so uh, that ended up being written into legislative session uh, into into legislation. And in the 2016 legislative session. Um, that passed as law in Maryland. So we are now working with the Police Training and Standards Commission, um, who is almost done with their set of best practices, and then Community Mediation Maryland will work with them to kind of unveil that and really try to establish police complaint mediation in as many jurisdictions in Maryland um, as we can. Just to be clear, the legislation encourages it in all the jurisdictions. It doesn't require it. So it'll still be up to the individual um, the individual agencies to decide whether or not they want to they want to implement it. So, um, I'm, do you want to say anything about police complaint mediation before I move on to dialogue with this? No, okay, cover it. So the second area that we wanted to share is the police youth dialogue circles. And so while the police complaint mediation responds to an acute incident that occurred and a resident uh, complaining about the incident, um, police youth dialogue circles is a more uh, sort of preventative uh, way to respond to the broader tensions that exist in the community, especially with police and, and young people. And so the dialogue circles uh, can happen in any number of contexts. Um, we are doing them right now primarily in schools and sometimes in summer camps and with, with recreation departments um, where we bring together uh, 10 officers and 10 youth and they have a chance to have dialogue that humanizes each to the other. Um, the process starts with an hour with just the young people and then an hour with just the officers. And in those two separate hours, people have a chance to consider what it is that they want to talk about, what it is that they might feel anxious about talking about. Um, what it is that they're going to need to do to be able to engage effectively and safely in this conversation. And then everybody is brought together for two separate two-hour sessions where the conversation goes from sort of safer or easier topics um, and slowly gets more, uh, goes more in depth. Um, and really in the second two-hour session, there is um, pretty intense conversation about the challenges of relationships between police and youth and what sorts of things could um, could change. So a couple of key things about the way that we're doing these. Um, one of them is that, um, and this is a really important piece, I've talked to a lot of people around the country, um, obviously the idea of bringing police and young people together to have conversations is not unique and new. Um, but when I've, uh, one of the things that um, I think is really important in this process is that it's having the same number of young people and officers. So one of the things that happens sometimes is there'll be, you know, 15 youth and two officers just because of the reality of um, police staffing issues and how many officers can sort of get to it. Um, but when you have a conversation that's sort of that lopsided, it ends up being more like a dare class or officer friendly um, and less of an opportunity to really connect on a one-on-one -on -one level and humanize each other, each to each other. And so we really think it's important, even though it takes a lot more logistical coordination, to have the same number of officers and youth. As I mentioned, it begins with sharing personal experiences and stories. Um, and then as trust is built, it gets more into uh, the conversation about interactions that each, the police and the young people have had with each other. And then it shifts to what could be done differently. Um, one of the key pieces to the conversation is one of the sort of one of the few kind of guidelines that we have is that people speak from their own experiences. And we find that when people are speaking from their own experiences, even though they're hard conversations, they are ones that have the potential to get to a deeper level of understanding, um, as opposed to when people sort of give their opinion about some clip they've seen on YouTube. Um, if we're able to stick to people's own experiences, then rather than debating what did or didn't happen somewhere else in the country, people can talk about what they can change in their interactions in their community. Um, we have tested these so far in Baltimore and Tacoma Park. There's plans for expansion to other parts of so both cities. Well, you probably know Baltimore. Tacoma Park is a city, it's a suburb of Washington, D.C. Um, plans to expand into other parts of the state of Maryland. And beginning in January 2017, the Baltimore Police Department is incorporating these dialogue circles into their in-service training. And so every officer in the city over the course of the next few years will have a chance to go through these um, dialogue circles as part of their training. 
So I'm about to move off of Please Use Dialog Circles. Um, if there's a question that's specific to this before we move on to the next one, I could take one. I'm not sure, Erin, if you have questions there. No, I, I, do, I don't see any questions right now. Okay. So the, the third um, area that we want to talk about is collaborative policy development. And so unlike the other two areas, what's different about this area and, uh, is that um, it is an opportunity to actually affect a specific policy of the police department or of the way law enforcement is conducted. And I'm going to hand this over to um, Marvin and Tracy, um, who are going to talk a little bit about, briefly about the Baltimore Uprising, which presumably you've heard something about, um, and then how that led to this, this collaborative policy development. Good afternoon, uh, Marvin McKinstry. Um, that's me in the picture. I'm a lifelong West Baltimore resident um, who is uh, after a young a life in my youth uh, that involved crime and criminal activity. Probably had my first interaction with West Indian police officers when I was about 11 or 12 years old all the way up until I was about 23, 24 years old and changed my life and um, really got into community advocacy but still had a real problem with the police. Um, in that picture is the actual Ground Zero Day at Penn North um, and literally that's my body in between some uh, Baltimore City police officers and some protesters trying to, uh, I guess in my own way, mediate that situation and um, keep those people from being arrested and, and that whole interaction going on with the police. Um, a little while after this, I met uh, the new incoming Western District Commander, who was uh, who is Major Sharif Briscoe, and um, we had a very honest dialogue, and she helped me to kind of identify some biases that I had towards police, even though I didn't realize they were so intense. Um, and our relationship kind of positioned me to uh, begin to review um, police officers a little differently. She gave me a call one day and told me to reach out to uh, um, the then executive director, um, Changa, of uh, community mediation here in Baltimore about this dialogue that was going to take place um, because she felt as though my voice would be valuable there as well as my ability to gather and bring young people um, to the dialogue. And um, we brought about six or seven young people to the dialogue and came in. Um, and there's, you know, I'm 41 years old and, and it was a uh, uh, amazing life change that happened um, for me because um, even when I stopped breaking the law, I had issues with the police. And now I have relationships with police that are literally um, putting innovative type of approaches to change in the community um, kind of uh, on the map in our, in our uh, West Baltimore, really across the Baltimore um, community is developing into some great things. I'm now a part of uh, our incoming mayor's uh, public safety committee, um, as, as well as working closely with the police commissioner. And all of this came after pretty much having great issues with um, the police and community mediation, giving the uh, opportunity in our dialogues to um, get to know that there were people in those uniforms and not just my perceptions um, and that we could work together. So I want to talk about um, this straight to Ford again. So I want to talk a little bit about um, how this how this got started. So the initial um, involvement with, com with the Community Mediation Center came directly from the police. And so the police reached out to um, Lord um, to have to help to help them have conversations with the community. Um, and so we knew that in having this conversation, we needed to um, engage every level of the police department so we needed people on the um, at the in the leadership role who could make sure that conversations were headed in a way that the decisions that were made were actually decisions that could be implemented that we had people who were in the uh, in middle management of the police department who could um, who could help troubleshoot areas and folks and, and officers who were on in on the streets who were directly touching folks every day um, and in, in the same way, we needed community members, um, a diverse range of community members um, to be involved. And so this whole process involved a lot of grassroots organizing. And it meant that 
as a mediation center, we had to, you know, it, it was years of networking involved in making sure that when the uprising happened, the police knew that we were the place to call. Um, also, making sure that we we had a reputation as an organization of people who would follow through with the work that we said that we were going to do. Um, we also had to work in, in um, developing a facilitation team. And so this was like a time in, in um, where everybody was on board. And so we made sure that we had a facilitation team um, and I was, I'm part of the facilitation team, so I'm a mediator with over 13 years of, of mediation experience um, and also having folks who have experience with the community um, and represented the diversity of the, of the neighborhood demographically. And, um, and so it, would, it involved both police officers, residents, and, um, uh, and business owners from, from the West, Western District. Um, and in, in, in developing the, uh, the group that would be at, in the room, we knew that we had to do big outreach. So if we wanted 12 people in the room, six officers and six residents, we knew that we needed to start off with 25 officers and 25 residents and that we needed to um, have individual conversations with them to make sure that they understood the kind of commitment that they would be making. So we asked people to make 16 hours worth of, um, of a 16 hour commitment for, um, for this project. So those, those conversations happened um, as much as possible face-to-face. -face. So we met with, with folks individually, talked to them about um, the policy work that would be happening, what that would involve, before we ever came to the table. Um, so that's over 25 individual conversations before we ever got to the table. The facilitation team met in advance, um, met in advance to talk to build the agenda together to make sure that we were um, that we were not avoiding the big issues, that we were making space, uh, that we were building an agenda that made space for big voices as well as some of our softer voices in the room that folks would not get um, mixed up. And then there's always the ongoing issue of making sure that we have a space that's safe for everyone to access. And so we went through a round of, of several several buildings. We settled on um, a church in the area that that allowed for different entry points for um, for residents so that um, there, there was initial concern about um, residents having it known in the community that residents were having conversations in the police. And so the, the, the building that we wound up using allowed for police officers and residents to come into different entrances so that um, it wouldn't necessarily be known that they were um, meeting together. Um, I wasn't actually involved in that part. I came in after the first session because we were without, um, we, we didn't have any young people at the at the table in the room. Um, I believe the first week I was supposed to be there, I actually had another commitment. Um, so I wasn't actually there for the prep. Um, what I can do is add a little bit about the actual conversation, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, it started off kind of vanilla not because we weren't being encouraged um, by the mediators to have an honest and, and real dialogue, um, but we had some people that were kind of tiptoeing through the tools until this one particular night, I think we were about midway through, um, it was kind of like, look, I don't have to keep coming to this if we're not going to be honest. Um, there were some loud voices, uh, uh, actual police official. Uh, broke down in tears out of our passion um, for this change work to happen in Baltimore. And then I believe that night was the birthing place of the group that they really began to move towards addressing a lot of the hard issues and, and just having the kind of transparency that would lead to um, where we are now um, as a collective group. To me, that was the best and most important session because 
it was kind of when the gloves came off and it gave people a chance to be honest and to see that there were so many parallels between the police and the community and their issues. Um, and it was a, a major embracing point to see that kind of passion out of, uh, when I say a police official, I mean someone who's right next to the commissioner. Um, to see that kind of level of passion is just something that when you're passionate about your own work, you appreciate. Um, and it really helped us begin to move forward under the guidance of community mediation to um, a great place that we're in now. And, you know, and part of, like, getting past that hard point was in the initial interviews with, with police officers and residents, we were very clear with them that to say that we're going to come to a point where you do not want to be at the table anymore. We're going to come to a point where there's going to be a hard conversation. And, and it is part of the work is that when you come to that place where you don't want to be involved in the conversation anymore, that you make sure that you stay engaged in the conversation. Okay. Um, so, so right now we are, um, the, the, the process that, the process that we're in in terms of the both and the policy is that, well, can, can, you, can you talk about that, Marvin? Yes. Okay. What, what we wanted to do is we wanted to be able to offer um, some alternatives um, to what, uh, some sort of a diversion process um, because we all began to agree that um, a lot of the nuisance crimes or lesser offenses were quality of life crimes, and if we would be able to offer options to people who were getting in these types of uh, situations, we would be able to make a difference. And it kind of came out of something that happened where a couple of our police officers who were in the room and uh, with arrestable offenses um, on residents, instead of arresting them, um, made the choice to give me a call. Um, again, working at the Youth Opportunity Center and being someone there that specializes in employment and diverting those people to me. Uh, it was kind of a um, ask for forgiveness over permission type of deal um, and diverting those people to me. And we began to have success with getting some of those people employment, those that followed through, which was more than not. Um, and that idea led to the policy that we drafted, which was a pre-arrest pre um, diversion program where instead of a person, diversion traditionally has been um, after arrest. And one of the issues with that is you still have this person that has an arrest record and it costs money to get the, um, the charges expunged and that causes a problem with people getting a job. This pre-diversion arrest um, program kind of uh, takes that person who we believe that diversion would be successful with and it gives them an opportunity to divert away from being charged or having an arrest on that record um, and getting moved into services. Um, primarily, we kind of focused around mental health, drug treatment, um, employment services, and I feel like I'm forgetting one, but those are the main three. That, and education. Um, so if a person needed uh, a GED or a job, um, directing them to something in educational workforce development, someone that may need um, mental health services or um, drug treatment directing them and, and those ways. Um, and that's really exciting to me, uh, working in workforce development, especially with youth and having people come in and that first run in that they had with the police is giving them some sort of tag or label that it um, that is such a, a deterrent to employers working with them. This, this gets me really excited about the possibilities and about what we've already been able to do. Two other things that were interesting in terms of um, what people talked about being important to them that led to the, the pre-arrest diversion. Um, several of the officers who were participating talked about, you know, part of them shifting how the community sees them. Like they want to be seen as problem solvers instead of just um, the bad guy who arrests you. So that when diversion happens further downstream, they're the bad guy who arrests you and you know, somebody else at court or the state's attorney gets to make the diversion piece. But if they could get to be part of the direct um, diversion piece of it, it could start to shift their roles in the community as, as being helpers, as being um, being problem solvers. So that was a an important piece of the conversation that led to this particular model. I think, and let me know if I got this right. Sure. 
Um, there was uh, one of our actual participants, one of the young people who came into the room and participated in many of the sessions. We missed them for maybe two sessions, and everybody was kind of concerned. And I got a phone call one night from uh, one of the officers who was in our group, and they had photographs of this young man um, pretty much doing hand-to-hand -hand and making drug transactions. And instead of taking that evidence, and arresting him, the officer actually called me. We met up. He showed me the pictures and said, Marvin, I'll give you um, until tomorrow to get a chance to talk to him and let him know what kind of trouble he can be in And um, as opposed to arresting him. And needless to say, we were able to rescue this young man. Um, that conversation that we were able to have with him um, literally got him out of the, uh, the the drug trade. Um, he's working now. He uh, finished out the process with us during the mediation process. Um, and I'm really excited about things uh, like that because his voice is far more valuable than mine in the community. And that officer who made that decision concerning him um, is viewed as um, a good guy in the community because Shalik was able to go back and tell people that, you know, this is what he could have did, but this is what he chose to do. Um, and I think that that goes um, a long way in healing um, the relationship that our residents have with um, the police department. Hello? 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 Basically, my experience was, it was a great experience because it was more really informative on how the officers felt because Usually, I'm not. I'm really not friends with officers. I know them, but I really don't know them personally. And like, we got really a close experience to know, you know, outside of work. And most was, you know, still at work. But mostly, it was just informative because they got our point of view and we got their point of view, and we understood each other more because with the Freddie Gray going, Freddie, Freddie Gray thing going on, you know, it was a lot of tension, and everybody, you know, they've been saying, you know, after police, but I really got a first first-hand feel of, you know, how they really felt. And, like, some really do want to do their job. Others, you know, they want to go against the policy, but most of them really want to do their job. And if I see them outside, you know, I, I, you know, shake their hand or I feel more comfortable talking with them because I know that they really aren't on any, can I say that word? Like, cruddy, like, any, 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 you know, cruddy or any, that, you know, most officers, they like beating people up. You know, they, they beat you up if you run from them, or they, you know, they go against policy. But these officers, these are some nice officers. Like, these are people I really uh, shake their hand, you know, wouldn't feel like, oh, well, he's shaking the police hand. He's you know, he going against us. I really, you know, I feel comfortable around them, basically. But everybody, that was Tanar that was Smith. He's one of the youth involved in the, in the, in the dialogue. And, um, and I, you know, one of the things I really wanted to say. So, if if you recall, initially we said that we asked for 16 hours of commitment, so eight eight meetings. Um, and so those 16 hours ended in May, and <laughs> this group is still meeting. Um, and we still, so we um we have been at about 100 hours, I think, at this point um, of of meetings, and we still are not done. We still have work to do. We're still putting the final touches on our plan. No, just to add that it was literally the group's this uh, the group's idea to continue to meet. We felt as though we came to a point where we could accomplish so much more. It wasn't encouraged by community mediation. I remember initially when the idea jumped out around the room, the thing was, where are we going to get money for this? <laughs> we were funded to do these eight sessions. And it was the passion um, and, and the, what developed in the room that, that caused uh, the people in the room to want to continue. And we were obliged by community mediation. Um, I think we all better for it. And so, and, and so right now where the group's work is around the policy, um, we're trying to figure out the funding to, to um, facilitate, as Marvin uh, described, uh, the diversion process. And so we're looking for funding for the position of um, Remind me referral. We're, we're a referral coordinator. That's the, the that's the position the group is trying to work out and figure out funding for. So just from a bigger picture perspective, this is Laura. I think the the really important thing about this process is this group over the course of several months has um, 
really has reached consensus and not just not just agreement, but really excitement about a new way to do policing. And I think as Marvin talked about this shift from um, real division in the community to um, real partnership and the group calls themselves the Transformative Justice Committee now um, and is really excited about this policy and is in a place where it's um, working on getting some final pieces uh, approved by le folks in legal and um, and identifying the funding to, to move the process forward. So, so that's kind of the uh, broad overview of, of three of the major areas that we're doing work in terms of police community relations. So I think at this point we'll we'll stop and take questions, and all four of us can answer depending on on what the what the question is. Hi, this is Erin. I don't see any questions right now, but if anybody wants to type in, um, I will. I can read them for you for you. Um, I was wondering um, if you could have um, take a moment to just talk more about the process of adopting the pre-arrest diversion program and and getting actually any challenges or buy-in issues with that, with the law enforcement agency. Do you mean the, um, the, the group's process to reach consensus around it, or do you mean sort of the legal technical process? I guess more of like the legal technical process of, uh, of how widespread is that um, policy, or is it just amongst the officers that are participating in the program? I mean, I'm assuming it is the officers in the program, but... So right now, the, the, the program will be piloted in just one district. Okay. Um, and so it has not been implemented yet. The group is, is, is shooting for a launch date of January, but okay. it will be piloted in just one district. But okay. It will, all the, it will be all the officers in the district, not just the officers who participated in the dialogue. Okay. Wow. Wonderful. Literally, it's literally been happening for months now. Mm -hmm. um, the Western District officers, um, had the word spread throughout the district and the Western District officer, I mean, the, the volume of calls that I get from them in a week is tremendous. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. It'll be an official policy <laughs> uh, soon. However, um, it's been in practice for, for quite a while now. Um, and I just shared that because um, I wanted to talk about how the police department or the police officers themselves have embraced it. Like Lori said, really wanting to have options to arrest. It's one thing for us as a community to desire that, but the police officers want to be able to do something different when they run into somebody that they believe would benefit from something other than being arrested. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think this sort of gets to why the why it's worth doing collaborative policy development. I think that often policies are developed top down and um, and so it's, it's hard and sometimes there's resistance to implementing top down policy. but. To Marvin's point, this is a policy that hasn't even been officially signed off on yet, but it's a practice that's happening um, because the officers, as well as the leadership of Western District, were involved in the conversation. So when people are involved in creating policy directly, they're more likely to embrace it because they've created it in a way that it actually responds to their needs and what they think needs to be done. And so, so that process that we've gone through essentially has led to a point where it is de facto happening even before it's an official policy that everybody in Western District is going to be required to participate in. Mm -hmm. Okay, any questions from our, oh, we got, okay, hold on one sec, we got one. Um, so here's one question. I wonder what plans you have to evaluate the programs. That's okay. one, and then oh, we'll start with that. Okay. So at this point, um, all three programs, um, the all of our programs have uh, pre and post, and then one month later follow-ups. And so there's some real basic questions that get at um, understanding between people and get at legitimacy of policing, and would you share information if you knew about a crime in your community, and do you think, and to the police, do you think that, um, that, are, that these residents would share information with you if they knew about a crime. So some of those kinds of questions. And we're looking at shifts from before to after to one month later. 
that's in the um, police youth dialogue circles as well as in the police complaint mediation. The collaborative policy development, the group has actually developed a set of, of standard metrics that they are interested in collecting data on going forward once the policy actually is implemented. Um, we have actually applied for funding for more comprehensive uh, evaluation. Um, we haven't gotten any yet, uh, so I'll just take this op opportunity to shamelessly say, since there may be evaluators on the call, if anybody's looking for a, a project to work on or has access to a funding source, um, we are actually committed to having really solid uh, quantitative evaluation of our programs. And so while what we will get from just the basics of what we have pre, post, and a month later, I think will be useful, um, we're also really open to um, a more comprehensive uh, evaluation that gets that gets deeper than that, and so we're interested in talking to folks who might be interested in working with us on that. Great. Uh, second question is, how did Community Mediation Maryland begin? Um, how did we start, like at all, with any of our work, or how did we start in this work, in this police work? Um, I think I think uh, it doesn't specify, so maybe just um, the early. Okay. emergence of, of it. Maybe you could speak to that. Sure. So this police work is, is one um, one of many initiatives that we work on. Uh, so in Maryland, there are 17 community-based mediation programs, as I mentioned. Um, about 15 years ago, there were just a handful of community mediation programs, and those groups uh, came together and said, you know, we really um, have a lot of potential in this, this grassroots social change mediation work we're doing, but how could we do it more effectively? And one of the solutions was to band together to create a statewide association to both um, support all the centers that existed and then also to um, help start new centers um, and then also to, to develop uh, creative responses to, so, you know, to using mediation in response to social challenges like um, like these that we talked about today, and then support all of the centers at a local level to, to do that work. And so uh, we've been around for about 15 years, and over that time, uh, you know, our ability to do that work, our funding and so on, has, has increased um, to, to where we are now. But it really started with a handful of local centers saying, like, let's come together and um, support each other and, and see if, if as a group we can be stronger than we are just as individuals across the state. Great. Okay, um, another question is, uh, you have done youth police dialogues, but have you done community police dialogues? So that's, that's part of the work that Marvin and I have been talking about. Like, um, we do have young people involved in it, but we have folks from, you know, various ages, um, longevity in the community, um, business owners in the community. So yes, we do do mm -hmm. community dialogues. And I think the model of the shorter model of, uh, you know, spending six hours doing dialogue circles with, with adults and, and, uh, and police, I think it's certainly applicable. Uh, generally in the areas that we've been doing those dialogue circles, the, the priority for the police department and the community groups has been to have the conversations with youth, but I think it's, it's certainly applicable, um, for adults as well. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, um, have you considered a hotline for citizens to report issues if they don't feel comfortable in a group setting that uh, that can then be used to evaluate these programs? Or wait, uh, have you considered, I meant have you considered, oh, have you considered, sorry, yes, have you considered a hotline? Yeah, so I think that, you know, just going back to where I started, um, when I was saying that this work is really in the context of a lot of bigger picture stuff that I think needs to be done in terms of, uh, you know, changes to the way that we interact with each other, communities and police. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that so we don't have a hotline that's not really consistent with the, the work that we do, but mm -hmm. we do work with, for example, the um, Civilian Review Board, and in New Orleans it is the um, Independent Police Monitor, who, uh, who run that community, that police complaint mediation program. And so I think, you know, among the partnerships we have, there are organizations that have hotlines and those kinds of things um, that could influence the, the processes that, that we develop. But the, the processes that we run um, are really focused on having direct conversations between law enforcement and communities. And a piece of the work that we do, and, and part of why Tracy talked about all of the early 
preparation conversations um, is is talking about what what do you need to feel safe having these conversations. So we recognize that not everybody feels safe initially, and um, so that is part of the initial conversation. And, and as Tracy mentioned, one of the things people said is they wanted a separate entrance so that nobody in the community would know they were going to talk to police, and so we arranged that. So, um, so we are supporting direct dialogue, and we are supporting working with people to make sure that there's the way that we're doing that direct dialogue is safe for everybody to participate in. Mm -hmm. Did you want to, and wait, there's one more answer here. We've, um, we've also kind of shaken the stick at the idea, well, of developing mediators in um, different communities and neighborhoods where um, there are things such as gang violence and things of that nature. Because um, one of the things that's the reality of, uh, of the youth dynamic, the urban youth dynamic here in Baltimore, um, some will never leave their neighborhood. And when you have such a great resource um, like mediation, but it's not in the neighborhood, um, then that becomes a problem. So we literally began to identify community leaders um, and not the traditional community leaders, guys who or people who may be respected in their neighborhood to try to bring them to um, the training to learn um, how to be mediators so that they can then take that work back to their neighborhood um, where it can be right there on the ground um, for those people who may not come um, to the work itself. Okay. Um, another question is, can you talk more about how mediation is included, or it might have been um, the, the diversion, but how whatever the training is that is, let me rephrase this, the, that is included in the in-service training. So I'm not sure if it's the mediation or I think it's the di the complaint dialogue. Um, but how, whatever, the, I'm sorry. I think I got it. It's the okay. dialogue okay. <laughs> that be included in the Baltimore City in-service training. So in yes. Baltimore City, what happens is that um, there's roughly 3,000 officers. And so to get them all through annual in-service training, about 50 of them a year um, take a week off of their street duty and go to education and training. So 50 people a year are in there for five days. And so what's going to happen is one day um, of those five days, 10 of those officers will be assigned um, to do a police youth dialogue circle instead of whatever other training might be happening. And so over the course of the first year, we'll get 500 officers through the dialogue circle. They'll, they'll be going, instead of reporting to the police education and training division, they'll be going to a school. And at the school, there'll be 10 youth who have been selected to have the conversation with them. And so over the course of the first year, we'll get 500 officers through. And then in the subsequent years, we're hoping to, you know, pull them two days and we'll get a thousand officers through, but in a few years, the hope is to get all of the officers through that dialogue dialogue circles. I, I think that that's what the question was, because that's what right. comes in. Okay, great. And then uh, one possible one last question: uh, Can you highlight the main differences between complaint mediation and a civilian police review board? Yeah. So a civilian police review board is uh, is is generally the design is that you have civilians involved in an investigative process to determine if an officer has violated policy and if so what the discipline ought to be. Um, the mediation process is one where the mediators are working on building understanding between the officer and the resident about the incident that occurred and possibly the resident and the officer have a chance to develop solutions that they think are uh, valuable going forward, um, but there's not an outcome that the mediators are um, imposing on the people involved, and it's not a fact-finding process. It's one that's working on building deeper understanding as opposed to determining who is right or wrong. So we actually work closely with civilian review boards. As I mentioned, in Baltimore City, the civilian review board has the option to refer some of the cases to mediation if they choose to, so the civilian review board may decide that this would be better investigated or they may decide this to be better mediated and so they can refer a case to mediation. Um, in the context of the, in New Orleans, it's the um, Independent Police Monitor, which is a, a civilian body that, that does, uh, that has the ability to do that. Um, and again, there they make the determination, would this better be investigated or would it be better uh, mediated? 
Okay, uh, another question. Actually, we had a couple more pop up. Uh, do you work with Ceasefire Cure Violence in Baltimore? What is the relationship between these programs and Cure Violence, if there is any? So the Community Mediation Center does a, a number of other kinds of mediation in addition to the police complaint mediation work. Um, and so in some of those other contexts, there has been some partnership work with some of those other organizations. Um, it, there, that work hasn't really, uh, we haven't really worked in partnership with those groups as it relates to the, the issues that we're talking about today, though. Okay. Uh, one last question. Some would say that pre-arrest diversion was once common years ago. I wonder if any of your participants have a sense that it's a return to a more traditional approach. Uh, State of Maryland doesn't have a history with pre-arrest um, diversion. Um, it's actually in the across the country considered kind of innovative. I know that we've had um, pre-conviction or predisposition diversion stuff. Um, we still have that stuff with uh, like marijuana charges and certain things now uh, around Baltimore, but uh, even in conversations with the police commissioner and, and some of the folks on the, um, the public safety committee, um, it, it's considered pretty innovative um, and most people kind of direct towards what has been done in Seattle, although um, I believe Baltimore is so unique um, in, in, in and of itself, um, that this, this is kind of considered cutting edge. But I do think, as to the second part of the question, I do believe that most people are believing it's a necessity right now um, mm -hmm. to, again, kind of take away some of the stigmas that are happening to people in certain areas because of what can be considered uh, small interactions with police officers. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that was our last question. And so what I would like to do is to um, uh, implement the poll. And uh, while we're doing that, I don't know, um, Jason, if, if you might be able to to do that, to open the poll for those people who are still um, here. There we go. And um, with that, I would like to thank the, the panel today, which includes Lori, Marvin, uh, Kennard, and Tracy. So thank you so much for taking the time to talk about uh, the program. And I would also like to thank everybody who is in the audience for joining us today. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed today's presentation uh, and will participate in future webinars. If you have any um, outstanding questions, um, I know we have um, Lorg's uh, contact information and we can always um, uh, forward on any further interest, um, Lorg, if that's um, all right with you. And uh, I think that's it. So thank you for joining us. Thank, thank you. Very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you.